we have matured, dare I say, to have to do things like take care of the land because, you know, if we don't, nobody else will. This episode of the Backcountry Podcast is brought to you by Majesty Skis America. Majesty is redefining skiing. It's a brand driven by skiers for skiers. They create innovative designs and they hand-build award-winning skis, including the Havoc, a Backcountry Magazine gear guide editor's choice in 2021. At Majesty, they consider versatility, lightness, performance, enhanced control, stability, and agility when designing every model. Whether it's touring, free ride, or all-mountain skis, Majesty has you covered. Check out their Skiing Redefined collection at majestyskiesamerica.com. Welcome to the Backcountry Podcast. I'm Adam Howard. Today's guest is Winter Wildlands Alliance Executive Director Todd Walton. An outdoor industry veteran, Todd's career has taken him from the Pacific Northwest to the Rockies, working for brands like Outdoor Research, Crested Butte Mountain Resort, Snow Sports Industries of America, and the Outdoor Industry Association. No matter his job, he's never been far away from the backcountry terrain he now advocates for from his home in Boise, Idaho. Formed in 2000, Winter Wildlands Alliance was created by winter backcountry users seeking quiet recreation on federal lands, often overrun by snowmobiles. While it was once a small, grassroots nonprofit focusing on the mountains around Sun Valley, Winter Wildlands Alliance now leads advocacy efforts in nearly every western state, and it has partners in the snow belt nationwide. Todd and I caught up the day after the inauguration of President Joe Biden. Todd Walton from Winter Wildlands Alliance, welcome to the Backcountry Podcast. Thanks, Howie. It's great to be here. So it's it's interesting that we're talking today, the day after the inauguration, and I know anyone in any advocacy capacity in the country has been watching with uh, great interest what the uh, appointments would look like in the new Biden administration. Tell me what you guys have been paying attention to, what you what you think of some of the appointments that will be interfacing with your work. Yeah, it's it's great to see that, you know, yesterday afternoon, immediately after the administration changed, that um, some of the things that we are neck deep in with the former administration are seeing some action. And it's, it's really exciting. Uh, one of them, you know, up in Alaska, there's a number of things going on. We, uh, we've got a litigation piece going up in there around the, the Ambler Road, which may just simply go away. But the biggest one that we're with the former administration that is, I believe it's the top three things that the Biden administration is going to be working on is the uh, process around NEPA which is the um, National Environmental Policy Act. And essentially what NEPA is, is the community uh, ability to have a say in what is going on in your community and what is going on in in the world of, of things like forest service planning. It gives the public a comment period to be engaged in what's happening. So a corporation can't just come in and drop a gold mine uh, into your backyard and, and put its tailings into the river. You know, back in the 70s when rivers were truly on fire, uh, the public stood up and said, hey, we need to have, you know, some comment and some input into this. And the former administration really took it and, and gutted a few pieces of it. But to see that in the top, you know, three things that this current administration, the Biden administration is jumping straight into is pretty killer. So our uh, litigation in that may simply go away, which is super positive. You know, it does need a little bit of reform, but it gives us the opportunity to say, hey, what the public does need is a true comment period and and the public needs to be engaged. And we have that, you know, right, uh, because whatever happens with things like you know, mining or road building or any number of things, we the public has to have a comment and we need to have a say in what happens. So those are those are two things that truly, you know, yesterday came down the line. Right. And, um, you know, it's it's really exciting to see us joining back into the Paris Climate Agreement and, you know, some of the other climate issues that are happening because, You know, while Winter Wildlands Alliance isn't a climate specific organization, everything that we do um, sort of touches that piece of the pie. Uh, You know, if we're protecting wilderness that protects trees and it protects wildlife habitat and it protects, um, you know, these these areas that aren't impacted by human, um, 
humans. And it gives us the opportunity to, you know, mitigate climate change and, and provide wildlife and, and wilderness areas to thrive. Let's step back a little bit from, from today and, and talk a little bit about the history of the Winter Wildlands Alliance. You know, obviously Backcountry Magazine has been involved with, with you guys for many years. Uh, and, and, you know, as I think back on it, it was really all about um, creating spaces in the, in the greater Yellowstone area where people could cross-country ski or backcountry ski without having to worry about the whine of, of snow machines everywhere. And it's really gone. It's, it's blown up from there. Uh, you guys mm-hmm. have all of this stuff happening and certainly all over the West in Alaska, um, partnerships out here in, in the Northeast as well. Mm-hmm. How did, how did the, the Alliance evolve from, from that specific topic to covering these issues everywhere? That's a great question. And I'm glad you asked because we're celebrating our 20th year this year. This is our, our 20th winter season. That's pretty exciting. Um, and you're right. We were founded in Sun Valley uh, to really ensure that the quiet spaces for winter human powered activity uh, exist. And yeah, it did have to do with the wine of sleds and um, in that particular area 20 years ago. So, you know, that was that was how we were founded. And and essentially we're the stewardship policy advocacy and the voice for backcountry skiers and human powered recreation on America's public lands. And our group is, you know, grassroots organizers, environmental advocates, backcountry skiers, uh, snowboarders, people that are out there snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, you know, that really want those quiet places in the mountains. And through the past 20 years, you're right, we've we've evolved um, quite a bit. And on a national policy level, we are, you know, neck deep in over snow vehicle uh, planning with the Forest Service uh, all over the country. And, and when I say all over the country, you know, obviously in the snow belt, there's a lot more to do, but things that we comment on and are involved with are nationwide. And that's usually via the Outdoor Alliance, which we're one of the founding members of. So we have great partnerships for, for summer use as well. You know, we work tightly with IMBA, uh, American Whitewater, and a, and a surf rider and a variety of other organizations to ensure that public land access and, um, the the environmental piece and the grassroots piece of of keeping winter or keeping wild spaces wild and quiet spaces quiet and you know all of the resources uh, available and and clean and preserved are kept that way and you know over the course of however over 20 years now uh, there has been a perception that winter wildlands alliance is 100 percent anti-snowmobile and we want um wilderness for wilderness sake and motors have no business, blah, blah, blah. And that's, that's a definitely a misconception. Um, our, our goal is to focus on the resource and not the rec- recreation. But when it comes to areas of recreation, there's, there's value in all parts of recreation and people getting outside. Uh, we just simply say, Hey, if here's the line, respect the line. You know, right. there's no reason for a snowmobile to go way deep into the Yellowstone backcountry in the middle of winter because it affects the different wildland habitat. You know, there's plenty of spaces where those are permitted. And, you know, we respect that. And we've got a lot of collaborations, especially over the past few years with grassroots groups working together to make sure that, you know, snowmobiles and and backcountry skiers are, are both respected because it's all public lands, right? right? It's not my public lands and this isn't my area to go backcountry skiing. It's all of our areas to go out and recreate. What have you noticed in the snowmobile community? Because, you know, let's face it, they, the, the snow machine community, and, and we all have many friends that, that sled or sled ski. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously the, uh, you referenced earlier, the, NEPA and and how uh, back in the seventies there we really had no seat at the table local communities and 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 that community is is something that Winter Wildlands has created in this certain area, but the the motorized community had a head start right. Mm-hmm. They were organized earlier, um, 
in many cases, not all. But mm. how, how have you seen the SLED community change and in how it interfaces with with your work and and these spaces? Because kind of we've all matured, right? It's not this. <laughs> It's not this us. It's not as much an us versus them conversation as it used to be. Is is that a fair assessment? I think, in general, from from you and I's perspective, I think you're spot on. You know, from a from a true backcountry skiers perspective, I, I think you're right. I think that the snowmobile community and the backcountry ski community are becoming a little bit more intertwined because you know if you want to get back you know, deeper into the backcountry, away from people, one of the only ways to do that is to access, you know, a sled and get back there and to get to certain terrain. And I, I feel like in certain areas, that's definitely the case. Mm -hmm. You know, you go out to Tahoe, you go out to, you know, Mammoth and, and other areas of California, um, even in, you know, Utah, Colorado, same thing. In order to get to the really good skiing, there's a whole lot of flat spots that you can just blaze through right. and as long as it's legal you know that's that's fine um you know here in in idaho there's tons of snowmobiles heading out there simply to snowmobile but you know with sun valley trekking last year we did a, a great hut trip for winter wildlands alliance and you know it's like five miles in so yeah you tow in yeah. um but then there's that line you know there's that wilderness line and then at that point you drop everything, you throw on your packs and you and you head to the hut. And I feel like with more people getting into not just backcountry skiing, but into um, sort of adventure and uh, seeing where you can sort of push those limits, that there is a little bit more understanding that, yeah, if I'm going to head out, you know, if my goal is to backcountry ski and I need a, a sled to get there, I respect the line and there is that community. There's that sort of unwritten code that we have as, as backcountry skiers that it's about, you know, respect and, and understanding that the resource is super important and you don't want to hear the whine of, of two stroke flying by when you're out there skinning up and, and you don't want to, you know, come across a, a high line track when you're, when you're dropping in, right? You know, I, I would say over the past few years, there there is a little bit more respect because more people are getting into the backcountry skiing um, aspect of that of that access point and right. using sleds to do it. There are still, you know, the recreational sledders out there, and they've got high dollar lobbies and um, a lot of money to throw behind their interests specifically. But I feel like these days there is a lot more collaboration and a lot more understanding uh, between the two groups. And it is because of, you know, folks that utilize sleds to get to the back country that can bridge that gap. Sure. And, and I'm talking to a guy who, who uh, well, we used to share some stomping grounds and that's Crested Butte, Colorado, mm -hmm. where, you know, a lot of ski tours have sleds because, uh, you know, if you're heading up to Irwin, that's an awful long walk um, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't. <laughs> So, so you get the culture, but let's talk about that for a second, because this is kind of where you were most recently before you started with Winter Wildlands Alliance. Um, mm -hmm. How did, how did you become interested in this work? How did you end up running this, this show? Yeah, I've been in the outdoor slash ski industry for damn near 30 years now. And I started um, in retail and uh, was a mountain guide for a little bit, worked in experiential education and in 99, uh, I ended up stepping out of that and working for outdoor research up in Seattle. And that's really where I cut my, you know, backcountry skiing chops uh, is in the Northwest and, you know, worked for, for OR for close to 10 years and ended up working for Crested Butte Mountain Resort for a couple of years, running my own business for a while, stepping in with Outdoor Industry Association, worked for Snow Sports Industries America for a little bit. And when this opportunity came up, um, it was really sort of the culmination of all that experience to not just push more product and not just, um, you know, sell things and promote things on a PR and branding end, um, but to really, you know, it's the opportunity to, dare I say, mature and put your money where your mouth is and um, 
fight for the lands and, and the issues that come up to the places where we recreate and the places that you know are so meaningful, not just to me personally, but us as an industry that um, you know can't speak for themselves to sort of rip off a, a Dr. Seuss yeah. uh, line there. It's it's important for any of us as recreationalists to stand up for the places where we recreate. And if you're a climber, you know, alpinist, yeah, Access Fund, American Alpine Club. Um, if you're a mountain biker, Emba. If you're a backcountry skier, snowshoer, cross-country skier, get involved with Winter Wildlands Alliance because that's what we do. And through the course of my career, it's been, you know, sort of dabbling it. I've always been a member of a lot of those organizations and to be able to be the executive director of Winter Wildlands Alliance and really move the needle is super important and I'm I'm very grateful for the opportunity. So for those of us who have been in the outdoor industry for a long time and, and I shudder to think that I'm now a veteran of that industry but it's true. <laughs> There were many years that we wondered when it was when we were going to get it together on the advocacy side in the outdoor industry. And I don't want to say be careful what you wish for, because I think we have finally reached that critical mass where we have the numbers and we have the interest. But it really seems like the outdoor industry is in, is as engaged as I've ever seen it. And there's really no going back. And it's kind of surprising that it took this long, given the kind of the shared values that I think a lot of us have. But mm -hmm. would you would you agree that that it did take a long time, especially on the backcountry skiing side, the cross country skiing side, to to get take Winter Wildlands Alliance as an example. You know, it was quite a small organization for a long, long time, focused in certain zones. And mm -hmm. you can almost track, you can almost say that the the growth in your work nationwide has been in parallel to this massive increase in interest in in participation in backcountry skiing. Is it the numbers thing or is it something else? I think it's a combination of both of those, Howie. I think between the, you know, kind of just what I was talking about, you know, a number of us that are veterans in the industry uh, that were focused, you know, on a brand end of things or a product development end of things. Um, you know, when companies mature, they're able to provide some resources to the advocacy organizations and, and be able to say, yeah, that feels good to, to give to whatever organization um, that does the work. But I feel like more companies are getting a little bit more entrenched. Um, and you're right, you know, there is that critical mass of actual users getting out there. And we'll just take this past year, right, with COVID, how many trailheads did you go to that were just bananas in comparison to years past? Uh, the backcountry ski and cross-country ski manufacturers don't have anything in stock. Retailers are sold out. And part of it is that people, the general population, you know, we've the outdoor industry has kind of always been seen as this sort of fringe um thing of people backpacking and going for long walks in the woods or climbing or, you know, doing whatever. But the reality is, is you can find a great outdoor adventure right outside your door. And more people are realizing that. And I think COVID sort of grabbed third and stepped on the gas for it for a lot of folks. And again, I'll just sort of take backcountry skiing as, as, a, uh, as an example, right? When we ran into each other at the Backcountry Magazine base camp at Alta, um, there were a ton of people there and COVID was just starting to sort of tip in that direction back in February. And throughout the course of the spring, the Wasatch backcountry was off the charts. And, you know, that that was the same at Berthoud Pass. It was the same uh, back east, you know, as long as there was snow there, more and more people were getting engaged with the activity of being outside, partially because they couldn't go into the office, but partially is because they need that, you know, people need that outdoor recreation to have that, that frame of mind and that really um, health benefit of being outside. And so throughout the course of the summer, um, you know, you couldn't buy a mountain bike, uh, you, you know, if you tried, yeah. um, because they were all, all the retailers were sold out, the used market was off the charts. And we've already seen it this winter. I mean, it's, it's not, it's 
what is it, January 21st right now. And, you know, cross country skiing, the, the numbers are already way up. Backcountry skiing, already there have been a number of avalanche incidents across the country. And um, that's really unfortunate, but it also speaks to the amount of people that are getting out and trying something new, or even if they're a beginner, um, they're sort of pushing the limits. And with the advocacy piece, the industry has sort of seen that that swell over the past number of years where it's cool to work in the outdoor industry. And with that, you know, sort of swell and growth, we have matured, dare I say, to have to do things like take care of the land because, you know, if we don't, nobody else will, um, you know, think about car emissions and uh, gas mileage standards and things like that. You just have to evolve in order to move forward and you have to really assess what's important. And again, I, I mentioned a lot of great organizations. If you're a surfer, surf rider, if you're a backcountry skier, cross country skier, winter wildlands Alliance, um, more people are getting involved because they do value the resource and not just the recreation. How much do you think the, uh, and I don't want to get too political here, but, it, but it is a great deal of your work, right? Is mm -hmm. going to Washington, going to state capitals throughout the, the West for sure. And, and, working with other nonprofit partners on certain projects, how much of your work was accelerated or the urgency of the work was accelerated over the last four years with the previous administration? And, and how much, frankly, did that benefit your organization? Because it's got to be a little of both, right? I mean... Yeah, it's a double-edged sword, right? right? Over the past four years, we've definitely... I would say as an organization, um, been a little bit on pins and needles of just, you know, like what the hell is going to happen next. However, a lot of the policy and, you know, the, the hard work that we do that's in the trenches um, doesn't happen overnight. But things like the gutting of NEPA have a much, much bigger impact. So, for example, in California right now, we're working on five different uh, forest service over snow vehicle use area, you know, just winter planning maps with the Forest Service to say, you know, here's here's great areas for backcountry skiing, here's great areas for um, snowmobiling, you know, where are the lines and really trying to figure out what use is more important. And that's that's like, you know, maple syrup, right? It just, it is a long, long process. And that process has been going on, you know, for a few years now, three or four in some cases. And no matter what the administration does, um, it can sort of bump it one way or another, but it's still a process. Right. So, you know, it's what Winter Wildlands Alliance does. There's a few things that take less time, but a lot of what we do is, is on the long haul and working with a variety of different agencies and grassroots partners and local organizations and, and, you know, working at the state level, the community level, and of course the national level to make sure that the backcountry ski community and the human powered winter community is represented. And again, talking about forest service planning, talking about that stuff, you know, it just sort of ticks along no matter what. And, things like the the NEPA comment period that can that can help accelerate some of the work that's being done but generally speaking on a national level um it's it's the long game it's, it's the marathon it's not the sprint right um and the t i mean you know and if if we pick like a certain area of the country there's a lot of hot and immediate issues that are super important that can go quickly like uh in the tetons the the teton pass issue of you know parking, sure. um, the, the amount of people trying to, you know, boot up a skin track, um, you know, it's an working. outrage. Yeah, it's an it outrage. is. It's, it's insane. And, you know, part of it is that, you know, we were all beginners once, right. You know, part of it is just education, but part of it is just etiquette. And, you know, this is, this is mine and not ours mentality. And I think we're, we're starting to shift out of that, I hope. But, you know, in the Tetons, there's a, a, very small herd of bighorn sheep that are protected and and we're trying to figure out where the where that habitat is um and where you know the guide services could possibly go to 
um, mitigate the impact of, of that wildlife corridor. And then, you know, you have Snow King trying to expand off the back. Targi is looking at expanding into a different, you know, wildlife corridor area. There's always something that we're working on. And um, sometimes it's a quick fix and, and we can jump in with both feet. Uh, and sometimes it's a much longer, much longer process. So Winter Wildlands Alliance is in it for the long game. <laughs> So, so much of what you do, uh, obviously, is on specific issues in specific areas. It's the long game. But over the last, I don't know, several years, you've you've started to do a lot of outreach at the youth level mm -hmm. with your snow school. Tell us a little bit about that. When did it start? What are some of your core tenets of that project? Snow school started about eight years ago, mm -hmm. and it was a a uh, community program here in Boise at Bogus Basin, which is the local nonprofit community ski mountain. And it was a program around fifth and sixth graders where, you know, kind of like a, a day trip, you'd go up and build an igloo and walk around on snowshoes and have a good positive winter experience. And through the course of that, uh, our national snow school director, Carrie McClay, is just an incredible resource. He's got a, a PhD in education. So he is he builds the curriculum. And over the course of the past five or six years, he's built a K through 12 snow science program. Um, it's still and, and we have ooh, 70 sites, physical sites all around the country. And those are all around generally fifth, sixth graders, and they're all about snow science. So at the beginning of the year, they track snow depth and then what that water equivalency can be. Uh, they look at snow crystals and, and, you know, there's a lot of science behind just snow crystals and how they form. Um, but there's also a few pilot programs of the K through 12 level that Carrie has created and how that goes into the physics of erosion and, you know, it gets much, much broader and also much simpler depending on the age group. And it's really been an amazing program that's growing. And uh, especially with COVID and a lot of homeschool, what we've done last year and this winter is offered snow school at home to pretty much anybody that wants to log onto the website. And, you know, if you've got snow in the backyard, you can go get a cup of it and watch it melt and figure out what the snow water equivalency is. Um, there's a lot of great videos that we've got on, on the website. And I think last year, uh, obviously we were down because of the transition between, you know, actual on-site snow school, but we got 33,000 kids out learning about snow science. Uh, and participating in the snow school program. Uh, and our hope there is to grow it with the online resources to provide winter education and a positive, you know, fun, cold weather experience for kids to get out and learn something too. Excellent. So if, if folks want to get involved, they just go to winterwildlands.org and, and it's right there. Yep. Let's talk a little bit about some of your outreach uh, it, that's you know close to me, and that's your Backcountry Film Festival. You know, obviously, mm -hmm. a great deal of your work as a nonprofit is fundraising, so you can keep doing all this work. Absolutely, we've been a partner with the Backcountry Film Festival for a lot of years now. It's like what sixteen years old, and yeah. still moving strong. I was thinking before we talked today, like, boy, I wonder how that film fest uh, project is going, given the reality of of our COVID reality where it's difficult to get together in groups to, to go to a local shop or auditorium to watch these great films you guys pull together every year. But mm -hmm. when we were talking before we turned on the mic today, you were telling me it was going great. How is that possible? <laughs> well, it, it is, it's going great because, you know, more people can watch it online. And um, this year we, since it is our 16th year, we took a, uh, you know, collaboration of the past 15 years and made a best of fest that we launched um, in the fall and just sort of made it free to a lot of folks and some donations here and there. But the 16th uh, annual Backcountry Film Fest launched and um, it's, it's generally a fundraiser for our grassroots groups. So um, our local snow school sites, our local backcountry organizations like Tahoe Backcountry Alliance, where you are, Granite Backcountry Alliance, um, you know, all over 
all over the West and and even Superior uh, Backcountry Alliance in the um, in the Midwest up there in, in Michigan, or, or excuse me, Minnesota. It's a really cool opportunity for communities to gather and watch backcountry, you know, films and and look at the the quiet winter spaces and landscapes and and get you know that winter stoke. Um, but this year has been a little bit of a challenge because of you know 100% online and lack of community gatherings but what we've been able to do is sort of geofence um the showings so for example granite backcountry alliance can say all right everybody in our community here's the link it you know donate what you can uh, or a ticket is $20 per household. And, and I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, depending on the group, but um, they're able to continue to use it as a fundraiser uh, for that particular organization. And I've been cutting some, what I would consider some nice sized checks to these organizations because of how our ticketing works. It comes through um, the back end of our system but to be able to provide these guys still some fundraising opportunities to watch the Backcountry Film Fest and to engage their constituents as well. Um, it's really cool to see people engaging and watching it um, at home, even though you know you don't have that community atmosphere of, of raising a pint or, or talking to your neighbor about where they've been lately uh, in the backcountry, but you know, it's been really effective. Um, I would say surprisingly so, considering it is 100% online. Our listeners won't be able to see this, but you're wearing a ski kind hat. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that's a, what does that mean? I know it's a project for you guys. Tell us about it. Yeah, it's, it is a project and it, you know, goes back to a little bit about what we were talking about before about the quantity of folks uh, getting into the backcountry, and you know, there's a lot of organizations like Recreate Responsibly that uh, launched this past year. Um, really, in the spring, we started talking about what it means to get into the backcountry and what it looks like. And in a partnership with uh, Tyler Ray, who runs the Granite Backcountry Alliance, um, we came up with Ski Kind as the backcountry responsibility code. And if you're a hiker or backpacker or you know mountain biker whatever activity you do you've probably heard of of leave no trace and essentially um ski kind is that that universal backcountry responsibility code that if i were going to sum it up in one statement it's rule one don't be a jackass rule two see rule one you know and if folks want to go to skikind.org uh, we've got a toolkit and it talks about different ways that that you can ski kind um and part of it is you know packing out what you pack in i mean again with the the quantity of folks heading into the backcountry um you know, if you've got your dog and, and you just sort of kick snow over your dog poop, well, guess what? Snow melts and that stuff goes into the water table and it's even worse with human poop. Um, you know, if a trailhead is closed due to COVID resource, you know, lack of resources uh, or whatever, um, you know, that means the trash isn't getting picked up. It means that you got to be a little bit more responsible for what you do. And so, you know, that also goes to being inclusive, like I said before, where we're all beginners once, right? So try and, you know, include people into the backcountry community. But it's also that that thing that, you know, when you learn to backcountry ski and when I learned to backcountry ski, I had some some great teachers and it's, you know, being aware of your surroundings, you know, being avalanche aware, take an airy course. Um, being respectful of other communities, whether it's snowmobilers or cross country skiers or, you know, whatever, when, when you're out there, you got to be respectful and you got to be aware and you got to be smart and you got to be self-reliant to some extent. And all that sort of boils down to skiing kind. You so know, don't, someone's... don't moon the helicopter. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And essentially that's it, right? It's, it's, you know, it's that sort of culmination of knowing before you go, being aware, being uh, responsible for your own actions and being responsible for the actions of the community. Like I said, you know, just don't be a jackass out there and you'll you'll be all right. So we got it. Ski kind. Be good to one another. 
Tell me what you're looking forward to most over the next year, both in your work and in your play. <laughs> in my play right now, um, that's the easy one. I've got another Winter Wildlands Alliance hut trip out here outside of Sun Valley um, the first part of March. I don't know if COVID is going to impact that. We're still assessing what, you know, what a yurt looks like with uh, people from all over the country coming in. Um but that's something I'm always looking forward to. Professionally, you know, this new administration is going to, uh, you know, we, we've got a lot of hopes on the table there. Um, again, looking at NEPA, looking at some of the projects in Alaska um, and being able to have an administration on every level that can move forward in, in a very thoughtful way. I think that's exciting. Uh, some of the forest planning that we're doing in California is supposed to wrap up this year. Um, those will be sort of the litmus test for other pieces that will happen all over the country as winter travel planning uh, sort of cycles through. It's it's sometimes on a on a ten year cycle, twenty year cycle. Um, all of that's interesting. And and you know again, there's some some other things that are uh, a little bit more urgent that we're working on that hopefully we can see some. Uh, action on really soon. And, and one of those things is there's a organization up uh, in the greater Yellowstone area that's wanting to, you said moon the helicopters a minute ago, and it just reminded me of that, <laughs> uh, up in the Centennials that wants to put in a heli permit, um, essentially in the middle of a snowmobile area. And it doesn't make sense for a lot of different reasons. And so we're gathering a lot of community support right now and comments around what that looks like and, and the true feasibility of it because going back to ski con just because you can do something doesn't mean you should and doesn't mean it's a good idea um so that's that's one situation i mean otherwise we're really winter wildlands alliance is 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 a 20 year old organization but the past few years with the backcountry ski community and the the growth that we've seen right you know the more more people that are out there we have such a great opportunity to get more and more people involved um to be able to take action and and to be able to look at their local communities and get engaged and that's really what i'm looking forward to is you know i could say growing the organization and getting more members and all that stuff but really you know yeah that keeps the lights on but it's about more people being engaged with the community and the process of looking at the recreation piece of backcountry skiing and cross country skiing and snowshoeing as the resource. And we can't let that go by the wayside. That's exciting to me is getting more people into it. So how do people get involved with Winter Wildlands Alliance? Well, the easiest thing to do is to go to the website and winterwildlands.org, uh, see what we're doing, um, get involved, you know, obviously, become a member is super important. Um, if you do something like buy a ski kind hat or some stickers, that money goes in to support a lot of the work we do. And if you live in Park City or if you live in New Hampshire, or if you live in California, we've got a lot of great uh, information as far as what's happening with our local grassroots groups on the website. You know, if you're, if you're new to backcountry skiing, um, get educated. You know, we the website's a great piece of resource as far as what we do on the policy, advocacy, and stewardship front. But get involved locally. Get involved with us nationally. Uh, learn more about what's happening in your area because there's always something going on. Well, Todd, I want to thank you for joining me today, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at that at that year. Uh, <laughs> that real sounds soon. great, Howie. Yeah. I look forward to it too. And, and hopefully we'll get together uh, face to face again sometime soon. It's been a real pleasure. Um, long time reader, subscriber, and huge fan of everything you're doing. So thank you for being a partner to Winter Wildlands Alliance and for everything you guys do. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Today's podcast was brought to you by Majesty, home of skiing redefined in North America. Check out more at MajestySkiesAmerica.com. The Backcountry Podcast is produced by Backcountry Magazine, an imprint of Height of Land Publications in Jeffersonville, Vermont. Lucy Higgins is our editor-in-chief. Our intro music was composed by Alex Paul. Bob Rusnock of Blue Stream Voice and Imaging engineered this episode. 
Additional thanks to Tyler Cohen, Betsy Monero, Mike Lorenz, Robin Earl, Paul Davis, Justin Ryer, Michelle Peoples, Holly Howard, Karen Heward, and John Costello. At Backcountry Magazine, our small staff works hard to bring you stories that are thoughtfully edited, beautifully produced, and thoroughly fact-checked. Please consider supporting our independent journalism with a subscription to the magazine. You can subscribe or check out other swag at our website, backcountrymagazine.com. Use promo code PODCAST for 10% off your entire order. I'm Adam Howard. Until next time, I'll see you in the hills. Thanks for listening.